uh, we'll find some time to touch upon a few of these. Uh, I don't think this roundtable needs an introduction, but for the benefit of the broader audience and in the interest of time, maybe I could just quickly uh, introduce the panelists that we have today. Uh, we have uh, Justice Madan Lokar, who is a former judge of the Supreme Court of India. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Harsh Mandel, who currently serves as the director of the Center for uh, Equity Studies in New Delhi. Uh, Ms. Renta Grover, who is a lawyer and a human rights activist. Uh, Dr. Mamidi, who is the director for the Center for uh, Social and Behavior Change at Ashoka University. Maya Daruwala, who is currently senior advisor at the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative. Uh, Bharti Ali, who is the co-founder and executive director of HUC. Uh, Jacob John, who heads uh, Access to Justice at Azim Train Chief Philanthropic Initiatives. And uh, Arant Lurengudam, who is a professor of law at Azim uh, Prange University. Uh, from our uh, partner organization, Agami, we have uh, both the co-founders, Supriya and uh, Sachin, joining us today, and also the, also the broader Agami team. So before, uh, before we kick off, I just wanted to set the context for our conversation today. Uh, so bear with me for about four to five minutes. I think at this stage, uh, we are more than familiar with the legal system that is bursting at the seams. At the intersection of the COVID pandemic, however, we are looking at a completely different order of uh, magnitude of risks for a system that in some ways is grounding to a halt. Uh, COVID has forced uh, courts to either shut shop or work in very limited uh, contexts, uh, both remotely or focusing on essential hearings only. Even post lockdown, uh, social distancing will continue to be a norm and courts will need to innovate and adapt for this new future. Uh, this is absolutely unprecedented. Uh, the challenge will not stop here. Uh, lost time will also mean a bigger backlog of cases and a surge in COVID-related litigation as businesses start to grapple with uh, multiple contractual violations, uh, employment and wage support claims, both against the government and the private sector, and really every branch of uh, the legal system coming under increased uh, amounts of uh, pressure. We also don't know what the behavioral implications of delivering justice in a new and a remote setting might be. Uh, does the quality of decision making improve or decline if the litigant is not standing in front of you? This also has uh, knock on effects on our overcrowded and underserved prison system, uh, which are now being called the quietly simmering reservoirs of infection, making this not just a humanitarian concern, but also a pending uh, public health emergency. Uh, the effects on uh, existing and uh, emerging rights and entitlements are also not positive. Uh, law enforcement agencies are now working at uh, reduced capacity and are focusing on uh, essentially ensuring uh, either lockdown or social distancing and not really looking at other concerns that might crop up uh, at a greater magnitude at this time, whether it's cases of uh, domestic violence or uh, child abuse. We also don't know what the impact on crime rates will be. Uh, Typically, historically, in situations of uh, conflict and chaos, uh, there is a tendency for uh, crime rates to spike, uh, spike up as well. And our law enforcement agencies might not be geared to respond to that effectively. There are some reactionary measures that have already been introduced. Our Supreme Court, as you all know, has now directed virtual hearings through video conferencing. It has also directed states to set up a panel to identify which prisoners uh, should be release so that we are not looking at a massive uh, uh, break of the pandemic within prisons. However, there remains a lot of uncertainty and unknowns around whether our legal system will be able to withstand both the immediate and the long-term impact of the crisis. So beyond the immediate and systemic threats, there is a much higher longer-term consequence to consider here. Uh, the post-COVID world that we come to occupy might be fundamentally different. Uh, baseline norms around uh, information sharing, uh, privacy, and surveil surveillance might shift uh, drastically. And the trust deficit that we've always faced as a society might just uh, amplify and become our uh, new normal. However, we also know, and uh, uh, Dr. Agram Rajan said this a few days ago as well, India reforms best in times of a crisis. So uh, the exigencies that COVID has brought uh, might help upend the current just justice system and take us in a new direction altogether, whether it's improving uh, long-term capacity of courts to deliver or helping create um, speedier forms of dispute resolution, uh, using data and technology to improve the quality of decision-making, and perhaps uh, a slightly more ambitious endeavor might be to move to new norms of civic engagement that are uh, centered around uh, better trust uh, and cooperation. 
At the same time, it will be very important for uh, the legal community to be deliberate and thoughtful about the changes that it seeks to bring in this time, uh, in this time of emergency, or changes that serve to empower and not exclude. As we've seen both, both during the World War and the Cold War, both of these events saw the world embrace a new language of law and a new form of legal infrastructure altogether. And COVID presents us that opportunity again uh, to make our uh, system more effective, uh, less mystifying, more accessible, but at the same time, protecting rights, empowering people and not excluding a vast majority of our uh, society would be very, very important for the legal system to ensure. So how we navigate this uh, uncharted terrain right now might, might just define our collective future. A greater focus of the conversation today and rightly so is on uh, is both on the health implications, but also the wider effects on the economy. But we thought it was uh, a great moment for um, a great group of people like this to come together and think about what the effect of uh, this pandemic might be on the justice system and how do we not just mitigate that risk, but also, uh, but also uh, make use of the opportunity that uh, this presents uh, to us. Uh, so with that, I'll... Um, uh, I'll kick off our uh, first segment, uh, which focuses more on the on the risks as you are uh, identifying them as a result of uh, this pandemic, both in the in the short short term and the long term. And maybe to uh, kick off the conversation, I would uh, request Justice Loker to speak a little bit about how you are looking at the court system being impacted as a result of uh, COVID. What are those risks that you are witnessing emerge, and how well do you think the system is responding to it? Thank you, uh, Aditi. Thank you, Aditi. Uh, you know, I'm a little uh, disappointed at the reaction uh, of the court or uh, the lack of uh, reaction uh, from the courts. <clears throat> you see, this uh, problem of COVID-19 is not something which has you know, happened last week. Uh, it's been there for quite some time. And um, I think the courts should have anticipated that uh, there is likely to be a problem. Now, uh, today we are talking a lot about, uh, you know, video conferencing and so on. But uh, let me tell you, uh, video conferencing has been in existence in the district courts, uh, maybe for the last about 10 years or so. Uh, you know, uh, prisoners uh, are entitled to use the video conferencing facility. Magistrates are using the video conferencing facility. Uh, so it's not something that is new. Uh, the only thing is that um, it was not being utilized to its capacity. And uh, there was no, uh, you know, initiative taken by the high courts, particularly uh, in trying to encourage video conferencing. So really, I think this is uh, one of the problems that we are going to face in the future. Uh, today, of course, it's a problem of uh, access to the court itself. And one of the solutions that has been found is video conferencing. The second uh, area where I'm a little disappointed is, uh, you know, the failure of uh, the legal aid authorities. I noticed that uh, very clearly uh, during the riots in Delhi, uh, when, you know, it was virtually helpless. And uh, a lot of NGOs had actually taken up uh, upon themselves to provide legal aid and advice to the victims. Uh, but here also, uh, you know, during the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, uh, I don't think the legal aid authorities have been able to do anything. It's not that, you know, uh, the problems of people have stopped. You know, there are still problems of, uh, you know, uh, domestic violence, for example family issues, criminal cases, employment, housing, wages. Now, where are these people going to go? So I think uh, this is a, again another problem that uh, you know, we need to consider. The third thing is uh, you know, the reaction of the court to some of uh, the issues that have been arising. Uh, I think there is um, you know, a narrowing down of rights uh, of uh, you know of the citizens uh, for example uh, you would be aware of the fact that uh, the rajasthan high court said that we are not going to list uh, an application for bail because it is not a matter of extreme urgency right i i, I import, but uh, i think yesterday perhaps or maybe on friday i don't know the bombing took a similar view 
and said uh, bail is not a matter of extreme urgency. So what happens to the rights of uh, people? Uh, then, you know, this empowers the government in a sense to flout orders of the court. So you have uh, those people who were named and shamed in Lucknow, for example, mm -hmm. right? There is no stay given by the Supreme Court uh, about those holdings. There is an order of the Allahabad High Court that you must remove the holdings, but that's not being done. You know, so it uh, empowers is not the right word, but I think it emboldens the state governments or the authorities, uh, you know, to flout um, the orders of the court. Um, also, I think, uh, you know, this thing is probably going to uh, lead to some corruption in the judiciary in uh, the matter of listing cases, which is an urgent case. How is an urgent case to be listed? You know, I think this petty corruption, which, uh, you know, had uh, come down considerably because of uh, the computerization of courts, uh, is now going to, I think, resurface. Uh, that is one of my bigger worries. So mm -hmm. there are a whole range of uh, risks, you know, that we are facing. Yeah. And uh, we have to find yeah. Yeah. So, so one major risk, as I identify, is just uh, reduced access. Um, yeah. and, and that's that's pretty clear and, and we can talk a little bit about what the opportunity for change might be there. Uh, but let's say within uh, within people who are indeed able to access the system right now through uh, it being deemed an essential hearing or, uh, or through video conferencing, what do you think is the uh, quality of decision making there? Like, would you see any risks around uh, that decision making itself being suboptimal as well when it happens in a remote setting or is that not a concern? I think it's a little too early to judge, uh, you know, because the kind of cases that are being uh, reported, at least in the newspapers, you know, are uh, public interest petitions. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know the manner of hearing, but uh, obviously it's being done through some kind of, uh, you know, a video conferencing system mm -hmm. and orders are passed, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, because of the limitation of video conferencing as it is existing today, um, you know, the, the orders, the, the, the lawyers who have come before the court or the uh, litigants who have come before the court, public interest persons, mm -hmm. are not able to get a proper hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, there was an incident, I think on Friday probably, when the uh, video conferencing system just collapsed, you know. So I don't know uh, to be in the case of uh, uh, children, you know, a 15 page order was uh, made available. Now, who was heard in that matter? Yeah. You know, what was the basis of that uh, order? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, while it is too early to judge on merits of, uh, you know, cases between individuals or between an individual and uh, the state, I think public interest litigation has, uh, you know, greatly suffered. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Kroba would just like to touch upon this point a little bit. From a litigant's perspective, how do you see this uh, risk manifesting itself. Uh, Justice Loker has, of course, spoken about the fact that the, the system itself is not accessible to you anymore. Uh, but uh, for a litigant, uh, do they trust the system even uh, less now? Or uh, do you think there's still a way for us to find some hope? Uh, thanks, Aditi. If I may just take forward what Justice Lokur has actually placed before us, uh, a wide scenario. And I think we need to understand that uh, it's not just that COVID-19 created a barrier of in-person litigation. We are working in a system, a judicial system, where um, the common citizens' rights and freedoms were already not at the center of uh, judicial discourse. This has further aggravated that situation. The dilution of freedoms that uh, um, or the understanding of freedoms, even within the judiciary that Justice Lokur has underlined today, uh, was all we were already watching that and seeing that. So today, what you are uh, seeing, you you are not entering uh, into a period where the legal system was highly responsive. You are working with a, within a system where already there is uh, there was a view. Um, and I think that view in the last one week we have seen has got further reinforced and magnified 
and this view has been in the making for a while in india and perhaps mm -hmm. covid 19 provides us an occasion to today take stock of it um, the mm -hmm. citizen is suspect uh, anything citizens say should not be believed for even if it's on epidemic a status report filed by the state where completely new uh, statements are made averments are made uh, regardless of what the federal structure is the union seeking directions to be given to the state which cannot be given under our federal system that status report without an annexure without facts without figures is taken as what is happening and the rest of us are expected to not exercise our cognitive powers even though we can see the migrants walking outside on highways even we can we can see them on television through reports or read newspaper reports we are not supposed to know that this is happening even today we know that ngos are feeding hungry people and it is not the government i have no dispute with people and citizens joining hands with the government in every crisis we will participate this is our country but we will not accept the status report blindly because it is filed by the union of india what allows that kind of acceptance in the judicial system is what i find extremely worrisome justice lokur used to head a bench which then withered away without uh, anybody knowing why called the social justice bench a bench that was supposed to be cognizant of certain social realities of our country i've been saying this for very long it may sound like we are we are going into other issues but i really think this is not a problem that is going to be fixed with technology we are riding on a state of affairs which has brought us to this point for instance when we talk about just just one minute we do not have diversity in our judiciary and for god's sake i do not mean only women because we find it kosher to talk about women now in the judiciary we need people sitting in the judiciary who understand the lives of people different from us we do not have that comprehension what does the judiciary do to educate itself you will not get an order on the life of a migrant worker because you do not know the life of a migrant worker what do you do to orient yourself to understand that how do you prioritize what matter in the uh, delhi high court for instance we are told extremely urgent matters will be heard who defines extremely urgent the registrar of the delhi high court it's harder crossing that hurdle today than actually uh, arguing your case once you get a hearing before uh, a judge in the high court so we are in a moment where we are actually riding on on we, we are now seeing all this in a much more acute form because this has been accumulating from the past and i think we need to go back to the basics of freedom and citizenship and reclaim that and i really do think that perhaps some high courts are giving very very important orders you are getting from uh, bank karnataka high court from allahabad high court kerala high court we need to focus on that the supreme court is not the only court in the country and maybe there are other courts which are for reasons of their uh, other reasons are able to be attentive to some other concerns why burden the supreme court with everything right as a litigant people are not being able to file uh what i'm hearing I'll, i'll just finish what i'm hearing from from clients when they are uh, approaching we are actually first having to take a long call how will we classify this as extremely urgent Okay. and uh, we are told as was said by justice lokur even in bail matters matters don't come to us unless you are dying well that is not the definition or understanding of freedom or personal liberty or even to get rid of a, a, a situation of highly overcrowded prisons of under trial overcrowding uh, which are not at risk to being let out uh, we are, I, we don't see a reconfiguration of understanding the situation during the pandemic right right so if i understand you correctly it's not so much uh, new risks that are emerging as a result of the crisis it's risks that have always been inherent in the system they've just gotten aggravated or escalated or exacerbated and and you've touched upon uh, rights and entitlements which is where um, 
really wanted to hear from Mr. Harsh Mandir and Bharti, uh, Ms. Bharti Ali as well on how are you seeing uh, the whole narrative around uh, rights and entitlements, which are anyway uh, somewhat threatened right now uh, further getting aggravated as well. Uh, Mr. Mandir, over to you. Some point in the unequal, uh, and it, it, uh, it's a country where uh, people of privilege and power have been extremely comfortable with this inequality, and all those factors uh, uh, and injustices are just, you know, hitting us uh, 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 very, very hard uh, when when we are confronting this pandemic. So, so if we have an executive which is actually telling us. Uh, that, that we we have we'll have a 21 day uh, lockdown. Please stay at home, uh, work from home. Uh, you know, keep social distance, wash your hands regularly, etc. Uh, without without an even an imagination that there's a large segment of people who will not get a salary if they sit at home, uh, who have uh, uh, you know who ha uh, have no capacity to have any kind of social distance, who may not even have a home, who uh, uh, you know who are living. Uh, who have no uh, water supply to be able to wash their hands. The fact that, that the executive has forgotten them completely and the middle class doesn't seem to have any outrage about a, a method of dealing with a pandemic which actually throws the large mass of the poor under the bus. So it, the middle class is being protected in, in, on, 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 you know, when the pandemic, if and when it, it, it plays out, the people who are going to suffer the most, the people who are going to have the least access to health care, who have, are also paying huge economic costs. So it's a time where all of these injustices and this uncaring about the suffering of, of, of people of disadvantage is coming, you know, coming, uh, it, it's showing up and it's going to have consequences which can even be catastrophic uh, in, in, in even the medium run. So if the legal justice system is ultimately a system to promote justice. That is where, you know, on that yardstick, I, 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 everything that uh, just Lokur and Vinda said, you know, wh where is the expectation that, that we can turn to the justice system to remind the executive of its duty uh, to protect uh, justice, to protect the right. So just the social and economic right to survive and to survive with dignity. You know, out on the street, uh, serving food from you know the first day, second day, I just you know I like, I come back home, uh, you know, so you know what we have we reduced our people to, you know, if the if the van is arriving, people you know are coming, it's like a stampede, uh, you know, people are so desperate waiting for food. What have we reduced our people to, and what kind of social distancing? What kind of and and then of course the migrants and, and their suffering, and and it's. It's a matter of no urgency for the Supreme Court at all to hear it. Again, the date has been advanced today. So so, I, so basically, there's this. And then the police, uh, I, you know, when you're looking around the world, I, this, there's a pattern, actually, that, that, that around the world measures are being adopted to deal with the pandemic by the executive, which, which greatly burden the poor, and which is increasing the power of already authoritarian governments further. So the police is seeing uh, victims of, of, of poverty and, uh, you know, who are trying to deal with a state which has abandoned them and thrown them under the bus as if they are criminals. And people are trying to hide the people who walk under the kilometers, uh, the way they're being treated by the police, uh, by the state administration, uh, uh, and people in prisons, people in custodial institutions, people in beggars' homes, people in, uh, and their greater vulnerability. So, so basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, what I hear is that the entire uh, justice system, not just the courts, uh, as uh, uh, as both Justice Lokur and Vinda said, these are problems that are carrying over from the past. But I think that it, at this moment, uh, the the you know all of these injustices and and and, and the anti-poor quality of our criminal justice and our legal justice system is only going to get accentuated and accelerated uh, but its consequences very soon you know if we have large scale hunger if we have people without work and jobs if we're going to continue this kind of very harsh lockdown 
if people start falling sick, what happens to people who don't have uh, health insurance and access to, uh, to hospitals? Uh, how will we also then the middle class and the rich will, will be able to uh, you know get health care and other people will have to uh, live again with indignity and with 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 with, with uh, so I, I have a feeling that this is a moment where uh, and in the name of you know uh, uh, the Supreme Court on its way to listen to uh, something which said that migrants walked out because of 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 fake news. I, I, it's just so appalling. Migrants walked out. If you and I were in a position where overnight you lost your work and food, and you were frightened about a, an illness that 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 you might die of, where would you want to be? You desperately want to be at a place you call home. It isn't fake news. It is it is the, the most elementary human response that you and I would also have in those circumstances. Why was it not anticipated? Why is it being criminalized? Why have people been treated this way? But if we cannot turn to our court, we can't turn to our police. Uh, where do we turn uh, in a time when the executive uh, has turned to anti poor? And, uh, and Mr. Mami, just to follow up on that, there are a bunch of new emerging rights and entitlement, so to speak, as well, coming out as a result of the crisis, uh, whether it's a financial. Uh, relief package or uh, or any form of state support etc that the government is now talking about but at the same time given that the enforcement mechanism behind this is still quite weak but do you see any of this actually manifesting itself in real relief and and also what can be done in such a situation sorry so uh, i missed the last line of what you said sorry yeah so essentially do you do you see uh, enforcement agencies stepping in to actually enable these entitlements, given that they are also just difficult to implement, but also there's no recourse really if they don't. No, I think that first of all, we need to have them step in to see whether these entitlements are equitable and just. You know, I, I, I was just looking again uh, at, at the idea, uh, you know, uh, what was the economic package? So if you calculate the economic package literally says that people will get the equivalent, some people, not all, some people among the large mass of the poor will get something that is equivalent to one or two days wages. Uh, suppose the middle class had been told that uh, you, you have to stay at home and you will only get two days wages, some of you, uh, and maybe five kilos of grain. Would, it, would we have accepted it? Would we have found it fair and equitable? If it is not fair and equitable for us, how is it fair and equitable the poor so I uh, and working masses. So I, I think that the enforcement and the actual access to these entitlements is still a second step. Can we have a legal system where which is going to even see the justice of uh, just in terms of uh, Article 14? Does it does it really work? Is there equality in the way that uh, that all of us are being asked to bear burden of this moment of crisis? We don't even have a legal system where we can go. For, for, for uh, looking at the content of, of these uh, new rights, let alone, uh, let alone their enforcement. Right, right. And I guess that's the challenge in times of an emergency. It just becomes easier to make these uh, second order questions, whether it's equity, it's, it's all about we are doing the best that we can and this can't be questioned in times like these. Uh, but would love to hear from uh, Ms. Bharti as well, given that you've been doing a lot of on the ground uh, relief work specifically. Or how are you seeing this uh, manifest itself, and specifically for uh, children and uh, women? Uh, Ms. Party, do we have you there? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, you can hear me. Please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. We can hear you, Ms. Party. Please go ahead. I am speaking with Bono. I think uh, part has been. Sorry, you, uh, your voice isn't very clear. Would you would you mind uh, coming closer to the mic? Uh, I was trying to use this mic, which is, I thought would work better. Uh, this is this is better. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. So uh, you know we are in a situation where, for instance, we are struggling with questions on. What is uh, you know more important, whether it's right to food or right to dignity, and how do we manage the two together? Uh, you know, it's it's that kind of a situation. 
the one thing that i want to say is that these are times when the courts cannot just take up matters issue orders and close them they have to because monitor that whatever orders they are issuing issuing are getting implemented and if there are difficulties in implementation then you know uh, other subsequent orders are passed to deal with those difficulties so that's something which uh, the courts have to learn to do in such uh, emergency situations uh the other thing that i want to point out is about uh, you know litigants who have no information at the moment as to how should they approach the courts if they are in distress in these times uh and neither nalsa nor the state legal services authorities are actually running their helplines to provide this kind of information so uh there's, there's a huge gap there and a lot of anxiety many fears as well uh the third thing that i want to point i mean and i'll give you some examples there are enough reports now telling us that domestic violence is on rise uh and uh given those reports uh, what are we doing are people able to get are women able to get protection orders uh, uh you know and and how do they then uh, access the system to get protection orders in these situations so if there would be a helpline providing that kind of information that would be important uh similarly with missing children you know when when 3000 people in delhi for instance were all at anand vihar bus station wanting to leave delhi to go back to their states i'm sure there were all kinds of instances of abuse exploitation children going missing and no system in place uh, you know to look at uh, to, to address those situations. besides uh, you know For, at least for missing children i know the courts are supposed to have a monitoring system the juvenile justice committees are supposed to be monitoring those situations are they doing it what monitoring systems are functioning at this point of time uh another question would be about how is the, how are the courts managing their own information systems even while they are conducting hearings at whatever level because wherever there are video conferencing facilities the hearings are being conducted Uh, to some extent so how are they managing their information system is another important issue and i'll i'll say i am saying that it's important because we don't want a situation where post crisis the courts sort of end up saying oh we are completing our backlog and then hence more delay uh, so those you know post crisis situations also have to be looked at and we start need to you know we need to start thinking about those situations uh, so these are some of the issues that are uh, bothering me at the moment uh, Uh, you know some examples that i shared with you current crisis but all and uh, and how do you see these i mean uh, some of these also look like immediate risks of course recognizing fully that uh, the system already has been broken and this is only amplifying some of what has already been wrong uh, but in the long term do you see some of this uh, shifting further to a negative side because you are you're looking at uh, elements like uh, privacy etc as well and just wondering that given uh, given that we are again in times of emergency does it give the executive greater power to uh, to curb basic democratic norms and the baseline just shifts because we just uh, seem to become more uh, accepting of uh, these changes that have been introduced because uh, we're all looking for survival at this stage and not really uh, freedom well that's exactly what i'm saying you know i i don't i don't think our courts can uh, forget the rules of harmonious construction and ensure that all rights are met uh, we have to we have to find a way out uh, to deal with these situations um uh, yes uh, questions of privacy there are questions of dignity there are questions of uh, uh, assistance and relief at the same time Uh, and 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 i'm sure through uh, through very clear and specific directions we can manage some of this uh, like i said in the beginning you know, there are orders being passed but no responsibilities being fixed mm-hmm. so we need to have responsibilities very clearly fixed we need to have uh, very clear directions rather than loose directions which are sort of uh, generally to say that you know we have to maintain dignity of people doesn't work we have to be able to spell it out and say this is how we have to ensure this uh so and how to are actually dealing with these situations on a day to day basis i think it's important to consult people who are, who are engaged in relief work in emergency relief work at this point of time who are engaged in litigation at this point of time uh like, like 
Sinda said, you know, you can't just have courts pass, sitting there and passing orders. We have to consult people. Yeah. Absolutely. I'll uh, shift tracks a little bit here because you also have Dr. Pavan in the room. And uh, Dr. Pavan, given that you focus on the behavioral aspect of um, actors in the justice system a lot, uh, how do you see some of this change uh, impacting uh, behaviors, whether it's the police or the advocates or the judges themselves? And how do you see that impacting the decision making as well? Uh, thank you, Aditi. It's such a pleasure to be with all of you. And I hope, first of all, at the very outset, that all of you are keeping safe. Um, let me, at the very outset, uh, start by uh, offering two assessments of the legal system and the judiciary. <clears throat> uh, this is even prior to the, uh, you know, the start of the COVID system. With regard to the government and the functioning of the government, and in, as a check against unilateral capricious behavior of the government, I think the judiciary has, the Indian judiciary has done uh, remarkably well in the past. I mean, if, if you were to look at the legal history, I mean, starting way back from Keshav and the Bharti case and so on, I think the judiciary has been a very noble profession. Uh, it has done really, really well. So institutions in that regard have functioned. My second assessment uh, of the judiciary, of the legal system, <clears throat> relates to uh, the protection of contracts. And that's where I think uh, we have pretty much uh, operated within a legal vacuum. Every time a contract, contract gets violated, it takes anywhere between 10 to 15 years to get redressed. And so we have tended to depend on alternative uh, normative means by which we can enter into uh, relationships with each other. So, you know, trust becomes a huge thing. Caste becomes a huge thing. Social norms become a huge thing. Private means of protection of uh, property then becomes a huge thing. So on one hand, the judiciary has really succeeded. But on the other hand, the legal system has also been a, 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 a bit of a failure. Now, my worry with the COVID system is uh, that the failure of the legal system is now going to extend to uh, the relationship that we have with the government. Because now the government is now starting to take unilater unilateral uh, decisions without the judiciary playing an active role. And that, is the, and, and, and that is the big question that we all have. And that is, will this become an excuse for governments to take the slippery slope of becoming more authoritative? So that's the big question. That's the big danger. I think that we need to uh, start thinking about. The second uh, sort of point where, which I would like to offer uh, relates to a sort of a, a, a behavioral criteria by which I think some of the policies have been taken in recent times, or, or, you know, with the advent of COVID and so on. And this is <clears throat> conceiving of the lockdown uh, conceiving of the situation as a binary between either having a lockdown or not having a lockdown and allowing the disease to spread. And the way I think policymakers have reacted to this situation has been uh, fraught with some behavioral biases. <clears throat> so if you don't have a lockdown and if you were to allow COVID to spread, you have some measure, even if imperfect, you have some measure of some estimated losses to society by way of death and so on. And so that becomes very salient. We saw the Chinese, we saw the Italians, and that plays very actively in our imagination. And that's called the availability bias. This is something that you know, Kahneman, Tversky, several behavioral economists, behavioral social scientists have talked about. Weighed against this is the other side of not having a lockdown, right? Which is protecting the, uh, that's, sorry, of having a lockdown, which is in some sense, creating a huge humanitarian crisis in society, right? So not having a lockdown produces death of some measure that you can visualize, but, <laughs> but having a lockdown produces a certain other kind of set of consequences of which we have absolutely no measure. We don't have an estimate of the number of people who are likely to die because of that. 
And one can only imagine, one, one can only strive to construct that number. And so going for the lockdown seemed to have been in some sense pushed forward, impelled by the strong need to respond to the reduction of the mitigation of the number of deaths due to COVID. Couldn't there have been a sort of a, a more uh, nuanced way of reconciling the sort of the utilitarian end on one hand with the sort of the rights-based deontological end by evaluating, uh, what, by evaluating what could be the potential consequences of, of the lockdown on the, on the poor. And in anticipation of that, take some ameliorative actions before the, the lockdown itself, or reconstruct the lockdown as, as, as a package between you know, preventing mobility of people, but at the same time, providing the support structures. Right? Yeah, so this no, is, the, just, yeah. Just for a second, uh, beyond, let's say, the lockdown, and I think the effects of uh, the lockdown are uh, somewhat understood at this stage, but what remains a big unknown still is what happens beyond the lockdown, because we're not really looking at going back to as things were, because social distancing will continue to become a norm, uh, to be a norm rather, for the, for the uh, six months or so. Uh, how do you how do you again see uh, courts reacting to that differently? Given that uh, behavior is something that you've studied uh, deeply, do you think that uh, decision making will become suboptimal if let's say the litigant is not in front of you? Uh, no, on the contrary, I, I I actually that so that's so this is what I talked so far is more a sort of a substantive justice kind of a thing, and what you're now talking about is the logistics of running a court system online. Uh, if, if I mean, th th there could be some positive spin-offs of, of delivering justice online. I mean, just as Loku said that, you know, we've all, already had this, right? Maybe running court sessions online might uh, reduce uh, biases that are involved when you see people in person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's, a, that's a possibility. I mean, the Rawlsian veil of ignorance talked about not being aware of where each individual comes from with a view to constructing an appropriate policy for the individual. Maybe doing it online reduces our opportunities of being discriminating against certain sections of society. Okay. So maybe it's a good thing. Okay. Right? Who knows? So from a purely logistical point of view, it might actually make it far more efficient. Okay. So why not? Right? But that's a logistics question. That's, a, that's an operational question about how the court system is structured uh, with this mutual distance between individuals. Okay. Yeah? Can I uh, move on to this one dimension that we haven't uh, touched on yet and maybe bring in uh, uh, Jacob and uh, Ms. Taruwala in as well. Uh, we are also looking at our prison system that the court at least is starting to respond to now, recognizing that there is a massive uh, threat of contagion uh, there, but uh, in, a, in a time like this, how do we think about the, the rights of the prisoners? And at the same time, also just thinking about uh, uh, if, we, if we do release everybody, are we unleashing some form of a, a bigger threat on the society? Because we also know that crime rates do spike uh, in, times, uh, in times of emergency, conflict, chaos, et cetera. So uh, given your experience working with, uh, uh, with uh, prisons and also the legal aid organizations that uh, both Justice Hooper and uh, Ms. Bharti touched upon, how do you make them more effective in, in contexts uh, like these? Over to you, Jika, and uh, Ms. Bharti. So maybe Maya should go first. I will go after Maya. Yeah. Okay. As far as the prison system is concerned, look, first of all, I'd like, to, I'd like to say that I just agree so much with all that Vrinda and, and Madan have said. Uh, you were asking earlier uh, about what was the new risk that we saw. And before I talk specifically about prisons, because it's very much related to all, uh, I mean, all that was said earlier could easily be said for the way that the justice system, prison authorities or, uh, or police or uh, the courts are dealing with it is um, 
could be said about what is taking place with the decision making on prisons. Uh, so just going back a little bit to the new risks, I, I feel that it, we are all thinking about it, but have not really said, uh, or maybe I want to just emphasize it, is that the new risk is that there is no pretense at keeping to the rule of law. And at the same time, you are creating a compliant population because the middle classes are, have got too much to lose by risking uh, coming and, and uh, you know, uh, calling out the government. There are a very few people who are really in that liberal camp who have got the power and the ability and the knowledge to speak out. For the poor and the very poor and the aspiring classes, you are giving them dole outs, whether it is dole outs financially, as you heard um, Harsh say, or it is dole outs of justice. You are seeing true, I, I see what, what Madan is saying uh, of disappointment with judges because they should know better. In fact, what you are getting is not justice according to the rules and the laws and the imperative of the constitution, but as caprice, when you say there's no, uh, uh, we will tell you what is urgent and what is not urgent, are you laying down the criteria? Are you holding yourself accountable for that criteria? When you say that we shall have X rules or Y rules in relation to giving you information about RTI, um, what are you doing? Are you carving out a niche for yourself, which is a niche of less and less accountability. And so I see this multiplying and the message of this will, as everybody has said, embolden the political executive. But at this moment in time, I do not see there being resistance to this. A riot for food is a riot out of desperation. But there's not going to be any riot for rights as I see it because you are putting people into, the majority of people into a position where they can't say anything. The other worry and danger is that you must constantly find, uh, you have an agenda. The agenda to my mind is taking us further and further away from what we used to call constitutionalism. So you also need to have a, const, a, a continuous reaffirmation of the agenda. Therefore, you have to find someone who is the enemy. And then you can make these grand gestures to say we should all unite. But where is that universe, unity? What is the conceptual basis for that universe, uh, for that universalism is no longer the universalism which we took for granted, which was rights, which was the constitution, which was rule of law. You're being invited to do, to look at it in a completely different way. And the lack of outrage, which Harsh was talking about, is a clear signal of the comfort with that. These are the things that are worrying me in terms of that. So if I talk to you now about prisons, or if I talk to you about the police, all that is merely specific symptoms of a larger deluge which is t driving us along. So, yes, I get outraged that the, the Rajasthan, I was going to talk about the Rajasthan court when suddenly it occurred to me the Supreme Court. The orders that it has given, for instance, in the migrants case, and the orders that it has given in terms of getting uh, uh, opening up the prisons, etc. To my mind, they are not clear. If you say, if one of your, uh, the dot points of the order is, don't delay, don't delay what? We have been delaying and delaying and delaying. And this, um, this sort of, we are being invited to feel that suddenly technology, and all we ever talk about in technology is video conferencing data and video conferencing. 
We don't talk about the court management systems. We don't talk about any of the other things that could help. The, the technology, we have had it now. Uh, the police have got all sorts of things, drones and heaven knows what else. When we talk about even coming back to everybody's favorite, which is video conferencing, have we done enough work to see whether video conferencing is actually even reduce the measurable number of people who are sitting as under trials today? Have we, have we heard whether video conferencing has helped to get people who needed it parole? Has it reduced the duration of people who are sitting there? Has technology within the police assisted in stopping them from filing false cases? You are seeing in the last three, four days, so much selective policing. Some MLA in Assam has said something and he's been put behind bars or there's an FIR against him or he will have to now get, grapple with, the, with the, the justice system. The Wire writes something which is perfectly honest about Mr. Uh, Mr. Bisht, the CM. And the next thing you hear is, that there's an FIR against them. Now they will chase around doing that and you can keep on filing cases like that. Now the selectivity of let's say face recognition, when we talk about technology being the wherewithal uh, or the thing that we are now next going to move with, there is facial recognition. We are told again and again that in the Delhi riots, the face recognition is going to point to every single person who took part in the riots. Is that same facial recognition going to show us the policemen who knocked, who, who killed various people, who didn't act when they should have acted and have done wicked, wicked things? So we don't even have the conceptual thought at this moment about what is the values that are going, what are the principles that are going to underline the inclusion, large inclusion of technology. Is it going to be that the government of India is going to say to everybody and the police and everybody is going to say, we are going to adopt those technologies that reduce the power asymmetry between the state and the citizen? Or is it going to be to the more and more convenience of the state just like video conferencing is. or So how is this going to play out? If you're asking my opinion, which matters to nobody, the, my opinion is that we are in for a perfect storm of authoritarianism. And the question really ought to be, what are the people who have been battling all these years going to do about it? Because there are no, going to be no newer actors that I can see except coincidental ones. Civil society has not brought itself together. There are liberals within the police. There are liberals within the justice system, uh, within the, sorry, the, the judiciary, within the lawyers, but we have not found the trust nor the mechanisms and procedures to come together to battle. I'm sorry to be so pessimistic. Absolutely not. I think that's just the times that we live in. Uh, Jacob, anything? So, you yeah, so uh, maybe, maybe I should have spoken first because well, thank you, Maya, you've covered pretty much everything I had to say. And uh, yeah, so I just highlight a few things which have been said and I'll emph emphasis. I think the one point that came out repeatedly was who decides what is a priority and that in, in the in listing of cases and so on and the, the fickleness of that system and the lack of accountability will continue to be a worry for time to come. And that's, I think that's one part. Um, the second is really, I want to talk about, um, you know, the, the, the fact that we have uh, the number of migrants who left or are, are queuing up to leave reflects, I mean, two, for me, two things. I mean, very, very clearly. One is a lack of trust of citizens in the system and a complete failure of governance. And 
these are things which have no short term fixes these are things you have to plug on and 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 of course the ability to deliver services quickly is kind of the third piece i mean the ability to deliver rations the ability to deliver uh, food is something that uh, which and the ability to deliver on an, a minimum income these are things which need to be built up in the system and these are need to be built up over many many years i mean this is not something that can actually be waved into action in a year or six months two months even less three days and that's a sense i mean or a four hours in this case when we actually shut down so it's a i mean the the fact that we uh are in a place where we i mean our governance systems have failed us is something that's very worrying and what that results in is what's even more worrying because what will be postulated is a silver bullet of um, a silver bullet of technology to solve all of these problems yeah and you know technology can do this and this and this and without realizing the nuts and bolts of governance are not related to technology it's about making making governments accountable making citizens more participate participate in the processes of government making sure that our process i mean the processes in the virtual world are actually acceptable in the in 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 in, in the physical world i mean these are things which are not um these these you can't wish them away i mean that's kind of the reality of it so um yeah so that's kind of, and i think that we have to ensure i mean and the the larger problem is the use of technology is used as a, is a, is a, in a convenient way to take away citizens rights without improving services for i mean services for them without in i mean take without ensuring um the i mean we improve state capacity in uh, healthcare i mean healthcare for example or even looking at citizen participation of how to solve the problem so that's where i am. and um, um we're at 7 7 o'clock now so i would want to move on uh, the next segment which is more around you know how do we create an opportunity out of it uh, but the most important theme that i've heard so far is um, forget the legal system itself but a failure of broader civic engagement and participation principles uh, so maybe to start with i would i would ask what do you think uh, how do you think civil society can play a bigger role how do you bring in the middle class the youth uh, to become a part of this conversation and to care about this a little bit more if you do if you do want to use this crisis to essentially signify the magnitude of the challenge that we are looking at but do we see any potential for uh, the broader civic society to rise up to the occasion or or a broader collaborative that can uh, that can come together to try to separate a little bit because until now uh, the lens that we've taken is technology of course it's the it's the first uh, thought that comes to mind whenever you think of uh, uh, doing something at scale or at low cost or efficiently but recognizing that it's not going to be the final answer or an end in itself mm -hmm. how do we ensure that we empower our uh, our uh, uh, civic society to act in ways that can complement that technology and not be uh, not be adverse to it so any any thoughts at all and at the stage uh, opening it to everyone but uh, jacob maybe starting with you um i think that the first thing that we really need to do is to engage as citizens together so we need a larger coalition that's built up and that actually demands accountability it should demand accountability of uh, the executive it should demand accountability of the judiciary as well and the old fashioned questions are not going to go away i mean we need the, those are the building blocks around which we need to kind of uh, uh, start um the second is that uh, i think that uh, rinda was the one who called it i mean the citizen is no longer central to governance i mean and we need to bring that back into the into the discourse where citizens are central i mean it's not about convenience of the state or you know about making sure that um, this i mean state i mean the, so if you look at it from an um, another angle i mean it's uh, is is it i mean are we shutting down the country to prevent bad optics is a question that a lot of people have asked i mean and this is across the world yeah so what is there a trade off between shutting down um, all business versus uh, making sure that i mean and and 
uh, making sure that there's delivery uh, uh, in like shutting down versus keeping the systems going, but at the same time ramping up healthcare, which was another another question that people people have also asked. So I think that uh, we need to make sure that the citizen becomes important again, and and the right I mean and rights need to, and civil society needs to pull it together. So these are the two things I would say which are kind of important uh, in this in this. Uh, Arun, any any thoughts from you at all? I know that you've been uh, looking at law and governance very deeply, and again, a related question is the civic engagement uh, principle as well. But even beyond this, any thoughts on uh, do you see any opportunities uh, for change emerging uh, at all uh, from uh, from this pandemic? I think you are on mute. Just speaking. Uh, can are you not able to unmute yourself? No, no, we can't. Uh, sorry about this. Maybe let me let me just figure this out, and we'll we'll come back to you. But uh, um, Ms. Grover, Justice Local, any thoughts on uh, what is that one big opportunity for change? Arun, I think you're okay now. Uh, Arun, if you next, uh, you should be able to speak now. Uh, yeah. So I'll I'll just say very briefly. So earlier today, uh, Nikhil Day from the MKSS was uh, giving a webinar, uh, and and I thought that's a very appropriate person to. Uh, to listen to in preparation for today's talk. So, so thanks, Aditi, and uh, thanks also for inviting me to be part of this very distinguished panel. And uh, it's very useful to listen to how uh, people who've been doing this for a much longer time are, are thinking of what we can do. Um, Nikhil Deb, uh, relying on his work with MKSS, uh, and I, th I think you want us to segue to the, uh, to the positive part, right? So we've talked about the risks uh, that COVID-19 presents to us and, and what can be done uh, going forward. So uh, one of the things that Nikhil uh, was stressing, uh, and this is something that Mr. Mandar also spoke about uh, earlier, is uh, trying to build on what we have. And we, we are quite aware uh, of many of the uh, problems that we've seen. And I think people who've studied these systems for a while uh, would have predicted this uh, would happen if, if such a crisis had come. Uh, I think there are some differences between us on how we see it. I think the uh, constant theme has been that many of the problems that we are seeing were already present and, and these ruptures are becoming clearer uh, in the way we are going forward. Uh, but one of the things that uh, Mr. Dave talked about was today in the Supreme Court, I think uh, MKSS was part of a, a PIL, which is trying to see whether Narega uh, funds can be made available uh, to people who are under lockdown. Uh, and, and his basic point was uh, under the rights-based legislation that we've had, and, and that was a long struggle, which resulted in, in, in the several pieces of legislation that we uh, were able to secure in the early 2000s. Uh, th there was a lot of debate uh, about uh, what, whether these were viable or not, whether you take the Food Security Act or the Rural Employment Guarantee Act. But today, there seems to be almost near consensus that if there has to be distribution of resources to the migrant workers, to everybody who's on the margins of society, then that framework will have to be used. And, and Mr. Day's point was, uh, we should probably work towards uh, strengthening those uh, frameworks. So I think regardless of which side of the political spectrum people are on, I think everybody recognizes that uh, the informal sector, uh, the migrant workers, uh, will need uh, support uh, and will probably need much more uh, uh, creative thinking, uh, especially when it comes to the laws uh, that apply to them. So we've known for a long time that the informal sector in India is as much as 90% of our economy. And, and for the last 20 years, labor law uh, advocates have been saying we need to look at that. Uh, and maybe this is a time where uh, because of this crisis, uh, that's something to to sort of focus on, um, and and I think in that sense th there are things to uh, to say where we can build consensus. If if there is some consensus that uh, what has happened to migrant workers, what is happening to daily wages, uh, is is you know inexcusable, and and I think there are people in government also who who are willing to concede that. Perhaps that's a place to build on uh, and see whether we can build coalitions 
uh, not just in civil society. Uh, uh, Mr. Day's point was this is a moment to really rethink the role of uh, state markets, the private sector, the public sector. And I think that's certainly an opportunity uh, to think about. Um, I would say just on the risks part, uh, I'll, I'll just raise two points and, and, and I'll uh, turn it back to you. Uh, I think people have raised a number of concerns. As somebody who focuses on the constitution, uh, I am a bit puzzled about uh, the non-invocation of emergency powers. Um, so the constitution actually enables uh, a number of uh, powers to be invoked. Um, you know, there's, there's been some commentary about uh, Hungary and how Viktor Orban has been given uh, you know, executive, you know the, the power to make uh, regulations by, by decree. I, I should point out that even in Hungary, which is not known as a particularly robust constitutional democracy, uh, the Hungarian parliament convened to give such powers to, uh, uh, to Viktor Orban. Uh, so to me, it's a bit of a puzzle that we uh, haven't thought about going down that formal route. Uh, and I think it's important to do that. We're still relying on uh, on a colonial statute and a disaster management act, which I think it's debatable whether that really applies to COVID-19 uh, and whether other resources need to be expended. Uh, so just thinking about, because people have mentioned the rule of law, uh, I would think that that's something that the government should also think about uh, is, is perhaps a formal invocation of emergency powers as we go forward. And this brings me to my second and last point. This is because of the implications for federalism. Right? So our prime minister, uh, in the early 2000s uh, and for much of the decade, uh, that first decade, uh, kept emphasizing uh, the importance of cooperative federalism. Uh, and we're beginning to see that as we deal with COVID-19, uh, those problems are really going to come up more and more and, and they will need to be resolved. Um, I, I live in the state of Karnataka and there is a real crisis uh, between Kerala and Karnataka in terms of how to resolve that. And the Supreme Court uh, hopefully will intervene. But again, as many others have said, uh, in times of emergencies, courts are not expected to and don't have a great record of resolving governance problems. These are things that really uh, need to be done uh, at, at the governmental level uh, and at, the, at sometimes the political level. And we're beginning to see that that's a source of uh, considerable tension. So uh, my hope is that not just civil society, but, but there will also be ways by which uh, state governments uh, will, will be proactive uh, in, in uh, responding to the situation and asserting their own constitutional powers. Uh, and, and I think that's something also that we should uh, mention. Uh, I'll leave it there for now. Thanks, Aditi. Uh, maybe uh, you touched upon something really interesting, like how, how this is now an opportunity to uh, re-examine how our markets function, how our economies function, how our foundation has been informal, but we haven't really been looking at it. And, uh, this crisis at least has made that invisible force slightly more visible because we're seeing this migrant crisis unfold, unfold right in front of our eyes. Um, and it's hard, it's hard to not notice, it's hard to look beyond. So is this an opportunity for us to start to think about reframing of rights and entanglements that are more centered on the informal and social security within informal settings as well? Uh, so we'd love to hear from Mr. Uh, Harsh Mandir, uh, any any thoughts at all? Like, I know that you were slightly pessimistic about how the uh, society has reacted to this, but do you see anything else emerging out of this where people perhaps start to care about uh, issues like migration and uh, informality of their working conditions a little bit more? You know, I think that uh, you know, uh, a metaphor we're hearing a lot these days uh, in the context of dealing with uh, the pandemic is, is the war, that this is a world war. Uh, and I think that, that we need to recognize that in this war, uh, you know, uh, some of the instruments of, of war are is science, is, uh, is the capacities, the kind of political leadership we have. But above all, I think we will win or lose this war uh, by our capacities for solidarity. Uh, and and uh, and I think that that is where, you know, if uh, you know, we can look at the decision about the total lockdown in many ways, but Truly, uh, from you know, it is not just that the poor are suffering a huge economic cost. It is also true that the you know the, the ability to protect themselves through social distancing, etc., was impossible to start with in the in the way that their life and, and the and the existential reality is structured. Uh, so so uh, so at least uh, so uh, so what I'm saying is that uh, if we imagine that the middle class can protect itself. 
uh, be economically secured uh, to, to a substantial degree and protect themselves for, in, from. Whereas the poor will live in these very cramped uh, locations where social distancing is impossible, etc. I, I feel that that the idea that that they will somehow suffer and we will protect ourselves is not going to happen. Uh, and we have to recognize going ahead that we'll have to find ways where the rich and the poor will have to either swim or sink together. And I think this is an opportunity for us to bring back solidarity to the center of how we imagine our country, imagine policy, and the idea of universal social rights, uh, which we've been talking about a lot, that within that everybody at least should be entitled to uh, a, a public access to public health system, to education and clean water and so on, to food and nutrition. So I think that the opportunity is basically that it, as we, uh, I think that they, you know, we might, if we continue down this kind of path of executive decision making, and I, I'm frightened by the idea of, of emergency power, uh, it, it, it will lead to enormous catastrophic human suffering. Uh, uh, and uh, and the only way to avoid it is for us to, even at this point, reg recognize that the only way to battle this is to stand together, rich and poor, Hindu and Muslim. I mean, the targeting of Muslims across the country is something nobody is talking about, but I'm hearing such frightening stories. Uh, so, so various kinds of, of, of schism that exist in society are only being deepened rather than us coming together. And the only opportunity is if we recognize the importance of coming together. Uh, my colleague Mirat has a, has a question for the panel. Mirat, do you want to jump in? Sure. Uh, thanks, Aditi. And thank you, everyone, for, for your thoughts. Uh, uh, we've been thinking about the implications of uh, this for justice in, in two different time frames and two kinds of settings, right? So, so if you look at all uh, public health models or all disease models, for a country like India, they're pre predicting a peak in terms of infection rates uh, sometime between, let's say, late April to late June, and then tapering down almost uh, to zero by the end of August, September, right? Just in, in terms of pure infection. So there are two time frames at play here. There's this immediate time frame of the next three to six months, uh, and then there's everything after that, uh, which is post-COVID, let's say. And across these two time frames, there are two kinds of things that the justice system will have to tackle with. One are cases and problems that are induced and triggered by COVID, right? There could be health-related stuff, there could be uh, job and income-related stuff, migrant cells. All of them are very tightly anchored uh, around COVID. Uh, and yet there's a very large universe of things which will get affected, which is not directly, uh, uh, there's no first order link between COVID and, and that. Uh, but the second order effects are quite high. Uh, so given how, how big this uh, whole thing is, uh, uh, my question to all of you is A, uh, which of these four quadrants, if you will, right? So the time frame that we have the next three to six months and, and then the six months and beyond, and then solving for COVID uh, and solving for everything else but COVID through the justice system is A, most important, uh, uh, because there's only so many things we can do in the next three, three to six months. Uh, uh, so that's the first question. The second question is which of these levers are likely to be most useful, right? So uh, there's, uh, Pavan talked about behavioral sort of changes. So, so it might be that the justice system requires some, uh, let's say, behavioral re-education of, of doing justice in a remote world. And there could be some financial levers of, let's say, offering people access to some, some uh, funds just to claim justice, for instance. Uh, there could be some infrastructure, uh, 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 some human resources. So, so again, just uh, capturing the two questions, which of these four scenarios must be most uh, critically think about? And number two, which levers should we be exercising uh, and, and where? Uh, th that was to any panelist who would like to sort of respond. Maybe Justice Lokul, I was uh, going to put him on the spot earlier, uh, but would love to hear from uh, Justice Lokul and, uh, and Ms. Kovic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you, Aditi. You know, uh, I think from the conversation that we've had uh, so far, um, I think a few things have come out uh, very clearly so far as the justice uh, delivery system is concerned. You know, I, I'm not so well versed about uh, governance, you know, as a part of the government, uh, but certainly uh, I'm, you know, 
pretty keyed up about uh, governance within the judiciary. Uh, I think <clears throat> there are three or four things that we need to do. Uh, and I would go along with uh, Vrinda, Maya, and Bharti on uh, some of these suggestions. Uh, you know, one is really we have to decide, the judiciary has to decide that what is the justice delivery system for? I mean, for whom is it? You know, is it, is it for the citizens? Is it for the government? Is it for the judges? Who, for whom is the justice delivery system? I think it is, uh, I, I have no doubt in my mind that uh, the focus should be on the citizens. Now, when you talk about citizens, you talk about all kinds of citizens. It could be the poor, it could be the very poor, it could be the middle class, it could be the migrants, construction workers, you name it, uh, they're part of the citizenry. So I think that is the first decision that the uh, justice delivery system has to take, the judiciary has to take, that we are in existence for the citizens. That's number one. Number two, uh, harnessing resources. I think uh, Arun had mentioned about uh, Nikhil Day's uh, view on this. Uh, harnessing whatever resources we have. Now, the judiciary has plenty of resources. Uh, Bharati had referred to NALSA, the state legal services authorities providing legal aid to the poor, to the marginalized people. What about migrants? Was any legal aid provided to any one of them? How are they going to survive? You know, what about their wages? Did the legal aid authorities do anything about it? Uh, absolutely nothing. I mean, as far as I know, absolutely nothing. So that's one uh, resource. You have under trial review committees, all right? Prison reforms, which uh, Maya talked about. What have the under trial review committees been doing over the last two or three years? You know, we would not have had this problem of overcrowding if the under trial review committees had done their work properly. Today, we are talking about releasing prisoners, right? But this should have started two years ago. Okay, then you have the juvenile justice uh, committees. What are they doing, right? Bharti had mentioned about that. Technology, you know, we've had technology, like I mentioned, for the last 10 years, right? What has been done about it? I mean, have we just, you know, set up the e codes project, you know, put the data on the internet and forgotten about uh, technology? Why are we waking up now? So these are the, uh, you know, things that we need to look at. What are the resources that we have? and how do we harness them in the best possible manner, then we can look at the uh, future. The third thing that I think we need to look at uh, is uh, you know, brainstorming. We need to introspect. I've been saying that for quite some time, that the judiciary needs to introspect. Find out where are we going. You know, unless you know where you're going, you just, you just keep staggering along. Do you see right? aspects for that introspection? Sorry? Do you see appetite for that introspection? Well, somebody has to take the leadership, you know, and appetite or no appetite, you better introspect, you know, better brainstorm, okay? Then one thing about, uh, you know, this uh, extremely urgent matters and so on, uh, you, you're probably aware, maybe the panelists are, uh, may, all of them may not be aware, that we have vacation judges, you know, when the court is on vacation for summer or winter or something. You have vacation judges. Now, it's been going on for the last 40, 50 years. What is an urgent matter? Right? If you're getting evicted from your house, it's an urgent matter. If your house is getting demolished, it's an urgent matter. If you're asking for bail, it's an urgent matter. If you're getting transferred from your place of work to another place, it's an urgent matter because you'd be uh, dispossessed. Right? So now we are evolving a sort of a new jurisprudence where we don't know what is urgent. We don't know what is extremely urgent. Suddenly bail becomes, I mean, forget about bail being urgent. It's not even extremely urgent. That's what some high courts have said, right? So we are evolving a sort of a new jurisprudence, something which uh, Vrinda had uh, adverted to in terms of uh, seal covering all that. And unless that is checked quickly, you know, you're just going to slide. And the judiciary will not be the judiciary for the citizens. It will become the judiciary for the government. So if the government says, our status report says this, the judiciary says, all right, we accept it. Right or wrong, we accept it. Our status report says something else, fine, you better accept it. And the judiciary says, okay, we'll accept it. It's not going to work 
in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. So, so one opportunity, Justice Bhakar, you identified is looking at the intermediate institutions, like legal aid agencies, juvenile justice committees. How do you empower them? How do you uh, strengthen them? That seems to be some area of focus that can go beyond, uh, let's say, technological shifts or civic society participation as well. And would uh, just want to invite uh, uh, Ms. Rinda into the conversation as well. Uh, do you see, uh, how do you see these institutions playing a stronger role going forward? Is there some capacity building or strengthening that can happen there? Because increasingly these might be the institutions that uh, litigants engage with in the absence of a full court uh, up and running. Uh, thanks, Aditi. I think Justice Lokur has uh, put it out very clearly for us. I just want to emphasize that in a moment such as the public health crisis, and I really would shudder for the state to formally adopt an emergency legal regime, since our rights are being suspended, many, many of them, without even having to qualify this as uh, an emergency uh, acquisition of power by the state. Uh, but I'll leave that for the moment. What, what we are seeing, what I would see is that this crisis would have required the entire judicial system to actually work more than usual. This is not a holiday period. This is amazing what we are doing. We are saying, oh, we can't, uh, uh, th there is physical distancing required due to a disease. And we all want to, want to keep ourselves safe and healthy. And that's, if that's the way forward, we need to do it in different ways. But the judiciary needs to be working more, not less. And yes, all these institutions, uh, whether it's the JJB or the legal aid services, nobody is on holiday. This is not vacation time for anyone. Uh, yet that's the manner in which it has been interpreted. In fact, one institution, which many of us have already forgotten about, is the National Human Rights Commission. Has anybody heard from the NHRC? Are any powers of the NHRC, have they been give, uh, set aside during the COVID-19 crisis? It is chaired by a former Chief Justice of India. I have yet to hear the NHRC utter a single word when all manner of rights and devastation is taking place across the country. Yet it did not come to be a note. They have so more powers. They have an investigating wing. Why are these powers given to bodies? They are given for them to be exercised when our rights are at risk. How are we going to reconfigure, we were being asked. We have to go back to the basics. Please, yes, all the JJBs, etc., need to be reactivated. When women are in distress for domestic violence, they will not call the police. They need to know where is the protection officer. Many states, have doubled up officers in Ministry of Women and Child who are doing multiple other jobs, including protection officers. Are those protection officers at liberty to move from one place to the other? This is not curfew. Just like a policeman is, has the right to go from one place to the other, essential goods are being supplied. This is the way you set a system like this in place. A protection officer, an abortion service, our crisis required needs and people should have, and I refuse to call them curfew passes, they must have mobility passes. Uh, why have those not been allocated to these people? Because you are not looking at the lives of different kinds of persons, much of which has been spelt out by other uh, panelists like Harsh. We have the no, two things I want to say here. Please read, how is the judiciary going to have and I honestly, I'm not sure of the behavioral uh, reconfiguration. I think that we just need to read the constitution. It places the, the citizen at the center and it tells the judiciary to reign in the power of the state and therefore to have faith in the state and suspect the citizen is to my mind, a wrong way of understanding the Indian constitution. We cannot have faith in institutions as we move forward. We will have to build a narrative outside the institution as much as in, inside the institution. I am not one who goes into a courtroom, even in a public interest litigation matter, with faith. I go in because I have a matter of right and an argument based on constitutionalism. 
So we need to really, even as civil society, re, uh, re-narrativize what we are saying and how we are approaching these institutions. And only then are you going to implore upon, when you asked about that appetite, that appetite is not a self-motivated behavioral change. You see the Supreme Court act in different ways because that's what's happening outside the courtroom. The narrative, the social movement, the, the citizens speak outside the courtroom is just as important. Magic doesn't happen inside a courtroom. So we need to understand all those dynamics as we sp- speak about it. I also think very rightly, as it's been pointed out by Justice Lokur and others, technology was not invented, video conferencing was not inv- invented with COVID-19. It has been around. Uh, what is our evaluation of it? I also want to mark here, because others have spoken about it, technology, for instance, the new Arogya um, app, which the Prime Minister asked everybody to download, does not track disease. It tracks us. It's a live tracking system of every individual in this country. Uh, This started with Aadhaar, and many of us resisted it till the very end. Uh, The Supreme Court did not understand the implications. The implications have become far more clearer to the NPR. The Arogya app is not a disease tracking app. The state should be tracking disease. Will the court uh, uh, foreground that or does it cede uh, uh, in good faith all power? I also want you to know that it's not as though the police is not working. Through the afternoon, I have actually been Uh, 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 in in a lot of arguments with investigating officers for the Delhi violence cases. And finally, and because they were harassing some of the witnesses and and drafting statements contrary to what has happened. And one of the cops said to me laughingly, he said, Madam, if you don't like what I'm writing, come to the police station knowing fully well that I cannot go to any police station during lockdown. So the police is not doing nothing or just working on COVID-19. This is a good time to do things without supervision, without any of us being able to intervene on behalf of our clients. And these are not matters which I can raise with any judicial system today. So place signal is given by the Supreme Court of India. If you're going to say, I will trust the wisdom of the government, What is the chilling effect going across the country is a question I ask myself. Absolutely. Sorry, Edith, we'll pause for for a second. Um, And uh, just just one follow-up. I I think we're running out of time. Uh, We'll wrap this up in the next uh, five minutes, if that's okay with everyone. Um, but there's something that you had touched upon earlier, Ms. Grover, that states are uh, stepping up and local uh, state level governance is stepping up in some ways. But do you see an opportunity there? Like, is it finally time to look beyond uh, Delhi and uh, see how we can identify those other pockets where we are seeing some positive uh, change emerging? Absolutely. Actually, I'm not a votary of rushing to the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, this is something, my position on this is well known to. Uh, my friends, many of whom are your co-panelists, my co-panelists today. Uh, I think high courts must be allowed to do work at first level. Very often, they are more proximate to the realities of, uh, lived realities of people of this country. Uh, Those realities are not uniform. There is no uniform citizen. The citizen is not a monolith in India. Uh, uh, The citizen uh, is on, on many, many axes, diverse. I think uh, we need to take inspiration from the high courts, which are actually some of whom are making, trying their level best to take this opportunity to create greater transparency, to be able to reach the last person out there. And I think we need to therefore, uh, in our own minds as civil society activists and actors, we also need to be strategic in our thinking and working. We cannot, we have to, and that's why I keep saying, please understand an institution. Don't go in with good faith. Good faith is not, does, is not the way uh, uh, democracies work. This is a democracy which is in play. So we need to understand all dimensions when we move forward. Absolutely. I think uh, we've run out of time, uh, unless uh, any one of the other panelists have uh, 
something else they would like to contribute, uh, maybe we could close uh, this discussion for today. Uh, but just to let you know that this is a um, uh, one and a half hour uh, conversation is not going to solve uh, anything at all. And uh, at least our uh, agenda, our broader ambition is to create a broader collaborative that can continue to think about, but also start to put uh, uh, some of these uh, changes in motion. So the next conversation that we've scheduled is uh, specifically around uh, the course uh, and also the potential for technology. But given the conversation today, uh, we're seeing uh, themes emerge around how do you start to reframe uh, rights and entitlements fundamentally? How do you do that? How do you enable a better uh, civic participation? So those are some other conversations that we have. But at the same time, I think we're also just trying to uh, see if there's some stuff that we can start to get onto the ground up and running. But uh, there is an opportunity. Uh, we don't quite know what the size of this opportunity is and how uh, negative or positive it might be in the long term. Uh, but it seems like enough of a crisis that we finally put our heads together and start to uh, actually do something about it and uh, taking this beyond, uh, beyond let's say, a roundtable discussion. Uh, so that's, uh, that's all uh, from us. Uh, thank you. Thank so you. Uh, Aditi, do you want to quickly share about tomorrow morning session? Uh, I think Supriya just wanted to share that. Uh, Supriya, do you just want to uh, share uh, tomorrow's session very quickly? Uh, somebody will have to unmute Supriya. Yeah, go ahead, Supriya. Uh, hi, uh, everybody, uh, uh, and thank you for this wonderful discussion um, and for everyone who's been listening. Um, we're doing this as a part of a larger series because we felt this is a conversation that must be had and unless we first understand the range of issues, uh, we're not going to be able to see our own roles and opportunities. Uh, as you all witnessed, today's call was more broad-based uh, in terms of seeing the spectrum of issues and how we might have to approach it. Uh, over the next few days and weeks, we want to deep dive into particular opportunities for action that might emerge. Tomorrow's call at 10.30 a.m. Um, uh, we, you can follow us on Twitter, Dagami underscore in, uh, to get the details and we will share it on our social media channels. It's going to deep dive more into how the courts in particular can function, uh, keeping in many of the values we heard today uh, of transparency, inclusion, and what is the role and opportunity for them to trans transition into digital um, courts. Um, while retaining the values of our constitution and what is the role we as a community can play in it. So we have an incredible panel again um, that will deep down far more narrower into this. Um, we also invite all of you, if you have suggestions or ideas on things you want to talk about or specifically explore as opportunities for action, please do write to us at teamatagami.in or, um, or just use our social media channels to chime in. But we have to hear ideas and see um, now more than ever, we all have to have greater role on the capital we can play, and this is just the first step to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you.